Good morning, everybody. It's the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, the content executive here at Higher Things. And joining me today for the very first time is, is Pastor Brad Meyer. Pastor, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's nice to be here with you. Great to have you. Um, we got to, to meet each other and really get to talking at, at conference this year uh, out in, uh, in in Bozeman, Montana, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, but but we we ended up talking a little bit of philosophy. And it's it's one of those, I think, Everybody talks about it, but nobody quite knows what it is. And, and in a lot of ways, and it goes underappreciated. And that's to our detriment. Uh, so everybody sort of has an idea that philosophy has something to do with thinking. But how do you actually define philosophy? Well, you know, it's an interesting thing because the, the, the definition has changed over the last couple thousand years because we've been doing philosophy for a long, long time. You know, the earliest philosopher we have in the West was Thales of Miletus, who's who was around like five or 600 years before Jesus was born. So, I mean, this is a long, long time ago. And uh, the ancient Greeks, you know, any kind of pursuit of knowledge, they just called it a philosophy. They called it philosophy. It was all kind of roped together. They didn't cut things apart like we do. But the word itself means love of wisdom. And so philosophy is using the mind that God gave us to try to be wise, to try to figure things out. And today uh, we use philosophy to try to answer questions about really basic stuff in the world that we use our minds to try to discern. So, um, you know, for example, the philosopher is not going to say, you know, do a chemistry experiment, but he's going to ask the question, well, why does mathematics describe the results of these experiments? How do we know that that actually shows that these things fit together and there's sort of a coherent reality behind it? You know, so it's really, really basic questions, which both makes it very interesting and very annoying, right? Because, you know, it's easy to get into this stuff and to find Lots of, of ways of breaking down things we thought and took for granted. Right. And it's an important question. Like it, it's, it's actually really one of the first questions toddlers really start to grasp with. As soon as they figure out a thing, it's, it's why all the right. time. And like it, it, you can see how important it is to want to understand the world that you live in better. And also how maddening it is if you're the parent of a toddler trying to answer why. 50 times. Um, but but more so, uh, there, there are ways then so that we don't have to some like completely reinvent the wheel on how to think about stuff then. And this is this is philosophy, right? The, the ways that we sort of go about thinking and, and reasoning. Right. I, I mean, to, you know, to overly generalize here, there's really two ways that we come to knowledge, right? One is to use the God-given gifts that we have to look at the world and think about it, um, which, I mean, we do that even in science. You know, we, we look at the world and we see stuff happen and we try to explain it. And philosophy is a little bit more basic than that because it's more based on, on the way that we think and on basic presuppositions that we have about reality and things like that, rather than observing things that happen in the world and then trying to explain it that way. Uh, and the other way that we get knowledge is, of course, God tells it to us, right? So if you go back a long, long time ago, they would talk about how there's natural knowledge, the knowledge that we sort of develop ourselves from looking at the world around us. And then there's revealed knowledge where God actually speaks to us. So philosophy is kind of the the friend of theology, because it works with the things that God has given us to try to look at this world that God made and understand it a little bit. And so, you know, like I, I always like to tell my kids here in confirmation class, because I always get the, the question, well, pastor, you know, some kid at school told me that we can't do science because we're Christian. And I go, well, that's sort of true in the sense that we don't do science like an atheist would do science, right? For the atheist, you know, they look at the world and it's just this object for them to tear apart and do with as they please. For us Christians, when we pursue any field of knowledge, we're trying to, you know, give glory to God by seeing how he's put this world together. You know, because like the Bible says, you know, Jesus is the one through whom all things were made. He makes reality understandable and coherent. And so whenever we look at reality and figure something out about it, we're giving glory to Christ. And that's a different disposition. It doesn't mean that we can't build computers and stuff or ask basic questions like what is right and what is wrong. But we have a different, you know, focus in it and a different, you know, sort of motivation behind it. So there's, there's an ordering then, and, and that sort of makes sense. So we hold the scriptures above our own reason because, well, who's smarter, you or God? If you're smarter than right. God, that's probably a problem for your religion. Um, so if, if philosophy then is just asking the question of why, you're assuming that there is something greater out there. Um, right. For, for then a, a, a Christian to do philosophy, it, it immediately becomes sort of subservient to the scriptures. Whereas um, if, if somebody apart from faith were, were to be asking these questions, it's still to support something, even if it's just sort of an insistence that there's not a God. Uh, you're asking the, the why with an intent behind it, right? Right, right. And, and that's a really important distinction. So, so there's something that the theologians call the ministerial and the magisterial use of reason, which are, you know, so ministerial means service, right? So when we use reason, we serve something. So as Christians, we use the abilities that God gave us, including our ability to think, 
to serve God, to support what he's already revealed, to, you know, uh, discipline ourselves and conform ourselves to him. Because, I mean, this is one thing that we often forget, you know, just to take a little aside. Faith is not a subjective thing that's inside of me, right? It's not, it's not something that I create and manufacture. It's something real that is put on me, right, yeah, by the gift the of the Holy in. Spirit, right? And then I actually then conform myself too, because when we talk about the faith, it's not my personal feelings or whatever. It's the faith, the deposit of knowledge that is Jesus Christ, Mm -hmm. right? That's what it's all about. And so this is another way to try to support that and get at that. So, you know, uh, it's one of the things that I really think is unfortunate in this world that we set up this false dichotomy between Christians, you know, who believe in Jesus and people who think. And in, in the, in up until the 20th century, this would have been assumed that, that, you know, if you're a Christian, you use the gifts God gave you, including your brain to look at stuff and figure things out. Right. And I don't know why we decided that that wasn't the thing we could do, but it's really unfortunate. Um, you know, we need smart Christians. We need to be able to engage with the world. We need to actually, you know, steward and care for this creation that God gave us. And that means taking it and developing things out of it. That's part of the, you know, the part of the conversation on that. I wonder if sometimes it's not just that people will tend to um, conform themselves to the standards that are set for them. And so if, if we tell them Christians don't think we, we, create Christians who don't. And if we tell them Christians do think we create Christians that do. But I, I mean, do, does some of the the sort of the the divergence that happened then in the 20th century that you talked about simply have to do with the fact that there was a place in time where Christians started asking why to th- learn about the things of God and the world started asking why to get away from that? Well, I mean, th- this happens over a long period of time, this separation. You can see it it really becomes kind of on the ground in the late 19th, you know, mid 19th century into the 20th century, at least by my study. But I mean, you can go way back into the Middle Ages and see this, the separation coming. You know, there's lots of discussions about why that happened. Even at the time of the Reformation, you can already see the pieces in place that are pulling these two things apart. And, you know, you get to the Enlightenment and it's very clear now that it's, you know, reason and, and knowledge and science and all that's over here. Faith's over here. And we start building this wall between them and they don't, you know, they don't have anything to do with each other. And uh, of course, you know, faith is not something we, we reason ourselves into, but that doesn't mean reason doesn't have a place in the life of the Christian, because faith is, is you know, supra rational. It's above reason, right? It's something that's beyond reason. It's not critiquable by reason in its essence, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things we can use our reason for in the life of faith. So like, for example, you know, uh, Jesus says, um, I'm trying to think of a good example on the fly here, but Jesus says stuff, Right. He says, you know, thou shalt not murder, right? In the, in the, in through to Moses in the Old Testament, like the word that is Christ is there in the law. And so we have the fifth commandment, do not murder. Well, what does that mean? When, when you read Luther and he kind of drags out the implications of that, he's using his reason to expound on and to bring other biblical texts that Jesus talks about this topic to bear when he writes out his explanation in the catechism so that we don't just end up with this very reductionistic thou shalt not murder means I literally just don't kill people. But it also means that I care for people in their body and that I don't harm them in their bodies. And there's all these other things that go with that. And and reason is the thing that ties all these things together in the way that we conceive and talk about it. Right. So uh, then when we get to talk about philosophy, what we we really get to do then is is, uh, not only challenge our own people, but but to actually respect our own, own people enough to say, you don't have to be dumb to be a Christian, that you're not sort of suspending reality like you do when you go and watch a Marvel movie where you just sort of say, all right, for the next hour and a half, I'm just going to ignore everything that I know and just go along for this ride. And then when it's done, you have to pick back up reality and go back out there as if there's not actually such a thing as Spider-Man. But here we actually want to carry our faith out with us. And that means you get to think as a Christian. Right. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's one of the things that's been observed, you know, in our society that there's this disconnect for a lot of Christians between what they hold in their minds, you know, the, the, the abstraction that it becomes to have faith and the way that they live their lives. You hear people complain about this all the time. And one of the reasons we divide those two things is because we separated, you know, kind of the real world with reason and thinking and all that from faith. And so faith becomes this sort of pretend reality that we do on Sundays. And then it doesn't carry over into Monday where we go to work and we go to school and we do all these things. And these things are supposed to go together. They're supposed to be one reality. And the problem is, of course, um, that's not the world that we've inherited, but it is the world we're moving away from, which is, I think, a nice thing. But there's a lot of growing pains that come with that, because unfortunately, for the last 100, 150 years, we have gradually forgotten how to think as Christians. And now we're trying to remember how to do that. And it's new for a lot of people. And so there's a little bit of discomfort that's coming with that. Yeah. 
So, um, Pastor Brademeyer, we're going to be, uh, every time you join us, we're going to be talking uh, philosophy. We're going to sort of start to think, you know, the, the how to think and, and why it matters. So, um, thanks so much for joining us today in the drive to school. I look forward to having you back. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Good to be, be good to be with you again in the future. Looking forward to it.